This is our third event of this academic year. We're not sure if we're gonna be able to squeeze a fourth one in. We're going to try. But if you're interested in that, the easiest way to find out, and indeed the easiest way to find out anything about the forum, is to go to our website, which is Health Policy Forum. That's all one word, healthpolicyforum.stanford.edu. That'll also give you a chance if you want to view any past events. Uh, they're all archived uh, on the site. So our uh, structure today will be a conversation for about an hour, and then we will open it up uh, for about a half hour for your comments, reactions, uh, and the like, and we'll have roving mics to make that work. As is usual with our conversations, our interviewer will be the estimable Paul Costello. Paul is the head of media and communications at the medical school, and he had before that a long and distinguished career in journalism and media relations. Our guest today is a true Renaissance woman. You will know if you've read her biography, Pam Bellick of New York Times. She uh, has really covered an extraordinary range of topics in her career. I, I initially became aware of her work in a series called The Vanishing Mind about dementia. And what was so impressive about it is some journalists get the emotional aspects right, some get the science right. She got them both right. I thought, this is, this is someone I'm going to keep reading. And I have kept doing that. The range of topics she's covered is incredible. Cattle wrestling, embryo adoption, and should seriously mentally ill people be allowed to smoke in psychiatric hospitals? <laughs> Most recently, what is it like to be a doctor on the island of Nantucket? Something I've always wondered about and now I'm going to learn about. <laughs> so um, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, her to Stanford University. <laughs> Thanks, Keith. Nice introduction. Oh, thank you. That was, that was great. How many of you have read uh, the book, Island Practice? OK, they are outside, so you can pick <laughs> it up to read it. We're going to talk a bit about the book, Island Practice, and why Pam found this idiosyncratic physician surgeon on the island of Nantucket so fascinating and such a compelling figure. And then we'll talk generally about her writing for the New York Times and her coverage of health and science and a wide range of issues that she's covered. But first of all, why Tim Lepore? You know, of, of all the people you could have chosen to do a book on, why, why did you find him so compelling? Right, well, just to give you a little background on how I, how I met Dr. Lepore. So uh, this was before my incarnation as a health and science writer, I was uh, the New York Times New England Bureau Chief and um, based in Boston. And I was asked um, to basically do a profile of someone in my region who had not been written about before, wasn't famous, but was doing something interesting in an interesting place. Those were the marching orders. And so I was sort of considering a variety of people. There was a, a guy who was... Um, running a, a nude bowling league in Maine. <laughs> I thought that had possibilities, but then, you know, the you Times... You couldn't do the pictures of the time. Well, the Times wanted to do video, and <laughs> it just wasn't, it wasn't going to work. Um, there, <laughs> there was a guy who was um, um, running a secession movement in Vermont. He wanted Vermont to be its own country. I think the idea was that they were going to survive on Ben and Jerry's Chunky Monkey alone. I, it, it sounded appetizing. <laughs> but, um, but then I sort of happened across uh, really just one little mention. Some people do read the medical school alumni newsletters. I guess I do. Um, and this was the Tufts <laughs> medical school alumni newsletter happened upon my desk. And there was one little line that said, um, our alum, Tim Lepre, um, is the only surgeon on Nantucket. And I thought, OK. I, I didn't know Nantucket at all. I, I thought I'd call him up. And he was just so engaging on the phone. Um, and uh, I, I became very interested in this question of what is it like to be um, a doctor, kind of the main doctor, in a community where you're on an island and, you're, and your resources are limited and your travel is limited. Um, and um, I went out and spent a few days and did a piece for the New York Times and immediately got calls from uh, book people who said that they saw the potential uh, for a book. And I started, so I started looking more into this. And the thing, I, I feel like I was sort of fascinated about it in kind of concentric circles. The central question, that initial question, what's it like to be juggling all of those things and, and facing all those um, uh, pressures in as a community the solo, like that. As a solo as, surgeon. As a, as a solo surgeon and really sort of the go-to doctor. I mean, he is 
the medical examiner, he is the football team doctor, he's the medical director of the hospital, he will fix up your animals, he will um, give you some rather unorthodox um, psychological counseling, he's the tick disease expert, uh, you know, you name it. Um, and so that became very fascinating, but also in a sort of, um, the person himself became very interesting because he has all these contradictions within him. Um, this is a, a, a doctor who, by definition, his job is to save lives, and he's a gun fanatic. Um, he's an NRA member. He collects 200 guns. He keeps them um, stored in his basement, um, guarded by tear gas, which um, one day went off in the face of the fire chief who heard a hiss and was opening the door. Um, his exam rooms are, are named Smith & Wesson. Um, his bathroom in his office, my favorite, is called Pea Shooter. Um, you know, so there was sort of those kinds of contradictions, um, this kind of brash, um, almost cowboy-like style that can be very alienating um, to people, but at the same time, incredible devotion to his patients, and, and actually underneath that kind of bravado, a very careful um, clinician. Um, and then I was also kind of interested in the larger issue of what does this say about healthcare um, in America? This community turns out to be a lot more complicated and diverse than one might think. Let me ask you about that. Yeah. You know, most people know Nantucket as being the enclave of the wealthy, right. and the playground of the wealthy. Right. But it's like Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket, off season, it's a very different environment. What's the environment like? It is, um, it, it is remarkably diverse. I mean, you have, so Nantucket has, I believe, still the highest median home value in the country. Um, and it supports this wealthy summer population. And yes, they are there. And Dr. Lepre treats them. But the, the implications of that for the people who live there year round, about 10,000 or so, is that it's an incredibly expensive place to live. Um, and so they are basically sort of struggling to hold themselves together in the off season, which lasts about six months. Um, they're putting jobs together. Um, they, uh, it gets very desolate and very bleak. Um, you know, there's sort of like a three mile radius that you can navigate around in, in, in the winter months. Um, and it's very, um, it's a very, very different, it's not all sunshine and flowers. Um, and at the same time, it, it attracts a, an amazing diversity of people. There are immigrants from Cambodia and Bulgaria and El Salvador, um, South Africa. They're, they're, they're all, um, and immigrants of a sense from the mainland, which Nantucketers often call America. And, and so you have folks who are there to kind of reinvent themselves, to they, they like the idea of being kind of offshore, maybe offbeat, a little bit you know, out to sea, figuratively as well as literally. And all of, these, um, all of these elements kind of converge in this 14 mile square island. And so you have this really combustible and interesting uh, environment. So it's strangely, I mean, you would not think it, but the diversity sounds like it's strangely a microcosm of America. Oh, yes. I, I found it to be very much a microcosm um, in uh, economically, um, ethnically, and um, in terms of health care as well. The, the range of diseases and um, conditions is extraordinary because people bring their own um, uh, remedies from various countries, they bring their own infections, they bring, um, you know, strange, <laughs> strange diseases from everywhere, and it's all there. And so you've got a, a small hospital, 19 beds, one operating room, um, six units of blood, no recovery staff, um, uh, you know, essentially one surgeon uh, dealing with all of this stuff. 
So what did, well, you know, the, the small, so you chose two stories. One was Lepery's story mm -hmm. of a surgeon on an island and everything that he was faced with. But what does it tell us about healthcare in America? Does it tell us anything about healthcare in America? Yeah, I think it tells us a lot. Um, and um, it's interesting as well because Lepery's hospital, Nantucket Cottage Hospital, was during this period where I was reporting the book, um, basically taken over by um, Partners Healthcare, which is the big hospital chain which runs Mass General and other hospitals in the Boston area. And um, so you have this kind of phenomenon that's going around on everywhere in the country of the sort of corporate, um, you know, corporatization of healthcare. And you have this incredibly individualistic doctor um, who in some ways is, is a bit uh, extreme, but I think also represents a lot about why people want to go into practice medicine. And, and I think there are lots of doctors who reflect aspects of, um, of the care that he provides, whether they're in the inner city or in uh, rural areas or in the suburbs. You know, they, they want to be able to have individualized relationships with their patients. Um, they, they bridle under the restrictions of insurance. Um, they don't want to give, you know, cookie cutter, you know, 15 minute appointments. And, um, and um, they're, they're trying to figure out a way also to kind of make a living um, uh, with all of these restrictions. And, and he's, a, you know, a, a, an unusual character, but he is emblematic of that struggle. Talk about the clash between partners and, because it's really interesting that they tolerate each other. Yes. Because they have to tolerate each other. Yes. That here's this sole practitioner who's a necessary, critical part. And if he walked away from his practice, yeah. One hardly knows what would happen. Right. Talk about the clash between, because it is sort of a, an American clash today between, as you said, yes. big hospital systems and physicians. Right. So he, will, he would refer to them as the suits. Um, and now remember, Dr. Lepre is the medical director of the hospital. And as such, he gets um, to say certain things to the hospital uh, brass. And once a year, he gets to give this... Um, PowerPoint presentation to the Board of Trustees, which he completely delights in, and he makes it very irreverent and um, somewhat insulting, um, you know, and they just kind of have to <laughs> sit there and take it. Um, he wanted to bring his dog in to use the ultrasound um, on the dog, and um, he did it in this sort of, you know, broad daylight way that, that, that just... You know, in your face. In your face uh, way. Um, and, um, you know, he might be coming back from hunting and have his gun with him and uh, pack that into the hospital. Um, you know, <laughs> um, and, you know, he feels that he, he doesn't, if you sit down and talk to him, he doesn't completely reject everything about, um, every, everything about having this merger. Although he does say, um, that you know, it's it's um, it's sort of like a marriage between a, a greyhound and a chihuahua. You know, he he, but he understands that there is some efficiencies that are gained, and there's some you know economies of scale, and there and there and there's some expertise that they get from a close relationship with these hospitals. But he wants to be able to choose his own experts if he wants to send somebody to. Um, you know, a Newton Wellesley Hospital or another hospital um, that isn't run by partners, he wants to be able to do that without having it um, be dictated for him. He has relationships with doctors all over the region. Um, and partners basically bridles at him, but sort of says, there's nothing much we can do. You know, we need him. And they know that he's a good doctor. And that's sort of the thing that always sort of comes down to it is that, um, he does well by the patients. Did you feel watching him as close up as you did? That, would you go to him? Would you feel comfortable <laughs> going to him as a patient? Did you think that he was a tremendous physician, surgeon? Uh, I've only been asked that question one other time so far, and uh, it's interesting. Medically, I would have no issue uh, going to him at all. Um, I, I feel like I know him so well personally that I'm not so sure um, that I would, but I do have I do have a lot of respect for him also as a person. And uh, um, one thing that um, 
uh, that, I mean, you would know that he would always be there for you, no matter what time of day, no matter how little the question, uh, no matter how kind of non-medical the question would be. Um, you know, he had a, a, a patient who I write about in the book who had this very involved case of, uh, of uh, narcolepsy with cataplexy, and um, he helped her diagnose it. He, um, uh, he put his, basically, you know, reputation on the line um, uh, prescribing Xyrem, which is the one medication that's approved to treat this, but it's very dangerous. It's basically a date rape drug. It was illegal for a long time. Um, it's highly controlled. You have to be part of a federal database to do it. It's very expensive. He somehow got insurance to cover it. And he has basically been, you know, not only her doctor, but her counselor. And re recently she, um, she uh, e emailed him in one evening um, a picture of a spider that was in her apartment and was freaking her out. She didn't know what the, <laughs> she sometimes hallucinates. She wasn't sure whether she was actually seeing the spider and what kind of spider. And, um, you know, Dr. Lepre's wife was saying, you know, why are you spending time with, with, with this patient with her spider? That's not your role. But he was fascinated and he looked it up and figured out it wasn't poisonous. And that's all just part of a day's work. <laughs> One of the things that I don't know how many of you know this, but um, Nantucket is the epicenter, one of the epicenters, if not the epicenter, for tick-borne illnesses. Yes. And I wondered if you could tell us about tick-borne illnesses, what we know about them, and what, what the and what Lepery has learned about tick-borne illnesses from being in Nantucket. Yeah, he's basically become a national expert on on uh, tick diseases, and. One of the things that I, I found interesting, there's all sorts of colorful stuff, but um, you know, Nantucket it didn't, uh, it, it's sort of accidental that it became this tick epicenter. Um, or even a home for deer. Or even a home. Well, so part of the tick life cycle is uh, dependent on deer. Um, and so uh, Nantucket used to have no deer at all. And then in 1922, I think, um, a deer was seen swimming in the water in the Atlantic Ocean, and a fishing sloop picked up this, this buck and brought it to Nantucket. And the islanders went crazy, and they had sort of a parade. And, um, and, and then you know they were worried that the buck was going to be lonely, so they enlisted the help of um, These are nice people on Nantucket. They are very nice. Um, they enlisted the help of. Breckenridge Long, who was a diplomat who helped form the League of Nations and also had a summer home in Nantucket. And he negotiated, I think it took about four years, um, the um, uh, importing of two does from Michigan. And they brought the does and they had another parade. <laughs> and um, the does and the buck got together and the rest is history. And, and, and you know, where are these deer going to go? Most of them are not swimmers. So they are, <laughs> they have heavily popul populated this island, um, which is fueling uh, the, the uh, you know, propagation of ticks. Um, because of the ecology of the island, um, there has been a lot of um, multiple sort of co-infected ticks. So we've heard of Lyme disease, but there are two diseases, one of which actually Lepre helped identify, um, that are really more dangerous, babesiosis and ehrlichiosis. Um, and a lot of the ticks on Nantucket have multiple infections. So um, if you get babesiosis, your spleen could rupture, you can die. Um, and there are, there's an outsized number of cases on that, so he um, he has has a little sort of research arm that he he does with tick diseases, and he will um, during deer hunting season he will basically camp out in the deer check-in station, which is the sewage treatment plant, and he'll when people bring in the deer he he'll pop out, <laughs> and he always carries a vial in his pocket, of course, and he goes through and picks the ticks off the deer and pops them in the vial and then he FedExes them to the mainland where he has a partner at Tufts Veterinary School and they analyze them for tick diseases. And actually just, I think last month, 
Um, he was a co-author on a study published in the New England Journal of a uh, fourth disease that was identified in part on Nantucket. Mm -hmm. so. you've, you've had a, you travel the country a lot, you have a, uh, as a science health reporter for the Times, how would you describe this moment in this country in healthcare? That's a big question. Um, I think you know it's a it's a very um, it's a it's a very pivotal moment in a lot of ways. Obviously, with what we're, will end up happening with the insurance system, um, I think uh, uh, a lot of that will depend on whether how states implement Obamacare. Um, but that as we can see from Massachusetts, which I, I covered, that was sort of the example of uh, healthcare reform there was the blueprint for Obamacare. Um, the state healthcare reform. The state health care reform, which was Romney's uh, baby there. Um, you know, it's gotten a lot of people covered, but, um, but it, interestingly, not on Nantucket. Most, but there's still about 18% of adults on Nantucket who do not have coverage um, uh, because of they just don't have employers or, or job situations that allow them to get coverage. So it doesn't work for everybody. But even with the coverage, you, you have this huge issue, which really has not been addressed, which is the cost of health care. And that, um, I, don't, I don't particularly see how that's going to end up being answered in the, in the current proposals. Um, and, that's, and as long as that isn't answered, there's going to continue to be pressures on the system like what we're seeing. What, what do physicians tell you as you travel around the country? What, what are, what's on their mind mostly? Is it the pressure of time? Is it the pressure of practice? Is it the pressure of having enough time with individual patients? Yes, I think that's a lot of it. Um, uh, there, it you know, it's, um, it's depending on what's, what uh, you know, flavor of medicine they're in. Um, it, it could be there, there are not enough, um, so they're overwhelmed. Uh, primary care physicians are having a hard time, um, uh, but yeah, yeah, you know, it's it's also um, uh, time that has to be spent with um, bureaucratic and administrative duties, um, uh, dealing with insurance companies, um, dealing with lawyers. Um, you know, it take everything that takes them away from the patient care is is not really why they went into medicine. When you sit down with someone, as you did for the book or any of your articles, how do you help get the story? How do you, what, what's the process for you as a journalist to go through and saying, I really need something compelling built here? How do you bring them out? How do you work with them? How do you engage your, your subjects? Um, well, I guess, you know, my approach, um, I just, um, I, I really try to have a very straightforward approach to the people that I that, that I interview. I, I let them know, you know, what it is I'm interested in. Um, I um, and I'm genuinely interested in what they have to say. I don't approach people with a preconceived notion or a judgment of, about, you know, uh, some particular aspect of who, who they are. Um, and I um, will often encourage them to ask me questions if they want to know what's the story going to look like, or you know, do you have to use this particular fact? Sometimes people are concerned about one um, detail of their family life, say, um, or their work life, which may not be at all relevant to the story that we're working on. And once you can sit down and have a conversation with them, you can allay their concerns. And I think, you know, also just trying to understand what their motivation might be for sharing their story. You know, one of the questions that I get asked frequently about island practice is that there are a lot of um, patients who are quoted, um, you know, by name, sharing very personal information, some of it very painful information. And um, I think that everybody has a different motivation. Some people find it you know, cathartic or helpful to f have somebody listen to them. Some people feel that by sharing their story, they may be helping other people. Um, and, um, you know, um, some people, I think, in this book, 
were interested in, were willing to talk about their own painful experiences because they wanted to be able to show um, how effective Dr. Leppard was at helping them, and, and that was worth it to them. And so just getting in touch with their motivation. Does it help or hurt that you're with the New York Times? <laughs> and, and is it depend upon where you are around oh, the country? It, it definitely depends, and um, it definitely depends on, on, the, uh, on the story. Um, uh, I, I've been writing uh, over the last year a number of uh, women's reproductive health stories. Uh, dealing with the abortion issue, and um, it does not always help with people on the anti-abortion side. Um, and, and they, um, you know, tend to ha tend to equate us with think that you, you have know, a bias. Uh, you know, East Coast liberal um, uh, editorial page wouldn't be to their liking. Um, so that takes a lot of work. Um, but I really do. Um, uh, make a, an effort to to say, look, I know what you you know might be associating with um, my publication, but here, you know, let, let me tell you wh what it is that I want to do. And um, uh, I recently did a story on uh, crisis pregnancy centers, which are the centers that are set up to discourage women from having abortions. And um, I spent quite a long time trying to find one that would allow me to visit. Um, many slammed doors and several harangues about the New York Times, <laughs> um, but I, I was able to find find one because, um, you know, I, I basically, you know, explained to the woman who was running it that um, that this was an opportunity for you know for them to demystify what happens in these centers. And if they're proud of the work that they do, and they are, um, then this is an opportunity for them to let people know what it is that they do. What, what do they do? Uh, you know, that was a fascinating story because as I find with almost every healthcare story, but especially stories that, that, that uh, you know, run up against political issues, um, where the rubber meets the road, where, you're, where you are looking at what is actually going on, it's always much more complicated and much more nuanced than um, people on either side of the political spectrum are, uh, would, have, would have you believe. Um, these <laughs> issues like abortion get hijacked by uh, the political um, uh, folks. And when you, when you look on the ground, it's much more complicated. So when you go to a crisis pregnancy center, um, they are offering women who are, who are pregnant and often don't know what to do, uh, yeah, they are talking them out of having an abortion, but often what they're doing is offering them emotional support, um, sometimes financial support, sometimes housing. Um, they are incredibly strategic in the way that they are um, uh, fighting against pa Planned Parenthood. Um, they'll put up, the one that I visited, which was in Waco, Texas, um, was putting up signs opposite the Planned Parenthood in Waco that would say, uh, there's a law in Texas that says you have to have an ultrasound um, within uh, I think 24 hours before you uh, have an abortion, and that the abortion provider has to perform it, and it costs about $105. And so they would put up a sign opposite Planned Parenthood that said, change your mind, we'll refund your ultrasound money, and just a phone number, and they would get people to go that way, and um, you know, it was. It, I, I thought that it was very instructive um, because, on the one hand, you know, there are people getting real help here, um, but also, it's it, it's it's instructive to somebody who is a supporter of Planned Parenthood why they might be losing uh, some of the hearts and minds in that. Uh, battle because they are not really reaching out to the hearts. When I went to the Planned Parenthood there and I said, um, you know, I'm a very efficient clinic and they're, and they're providing good medical care. And I said, do you give them any emotional support? And, and they said, we, we are not our patient's emotional counselor. We're their medical provider. And I was thinking, well, you know, if you were, you might. 
Let me ask you about a story. You wrote a fascinating piece a couple of years ago about the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease within an extended family of 5,000 people in a Andean mountain village in Colombia. How, how did you first come about finding this family? And, and what are US researchers learning about prevention from this group of people? Yeah, so I, um, uh, my, uh, editor said to me, um, "Go to the Andes and solve a problem." No, no, no. She said, "What? Well, what kind of subject would interest you if you're interested? If you is there a line of reporting for this next year that you might be interested in?" So I said, "Well, you know, how about Alzheimer's?" And now I'm, you know, relatively new to the to the science department, and there are people with a tremendous amount of expertise. Um, and that is very helpful. Um, it can, what I provide, um, I think, and why they do bring new people on, is that I tend to be maybe more easily surprised by certain things, and I don't feel like I've read it all before. I've written that story before. Um, so she said, well, you know, I, I'm not really sure um, that there's going to be that much new to say about Alzheimer's, because all of these treatments that have been tried, they don't really work. Um, but poke around and see what you find. So I, I poked, and I'm, I'm, I'm a, a persistent poker. And um, I sort of noticed a reference after talking to a whole bunch of people. It was like in the bottom of an email to this family in Colombia. And I talked to one person, another person, another person. And it turned out that this is the largest family in the world to, um, to suffer from uh, genetic Alzheimer's. Generation after generation after generation. Right. And, and and part of it is because, as you said, this is a, you know, it's a, it's a very isolated community. It's a tremendous amount of intermarriage. So the family, currently there are about 5,000 people, probably about a third of them have a single genetic mutation that causes them to get Alzheimer's in their 40s. Um, it's, it's devastating, obviously. Um, and um, so I was able to go down there um, with a photographer and spend some time um, uh, talking to some of these families. We went to some fairly dicey areas, um, uh, and um, but we were able to talk to them. And I learned that there were scientists who were studying these families and that they were looking at them for a very compelling potentially groundbreaking reason, because why, one of the reasons why we haven't been able to figure out what works for Alzheimer's is that all these drugs that we're testing have been on people who already have the disease. And the thinking is maybe those are not the wrong drugs. Maybe it's just way too late. The brain is so ravaged that, that it's, you know, we're just fighting a losing battle. But how do you test beforehand when we really don't know what is going to cause Alzheimer's to a degree where you can actually set up a clinical trial. Well, with this family we do because we know that if you have the mutation, you're going to get it, and we know roughly when. Um, what percentage of the of this family comes down with this? We think disease? it's about a third. Yeah, um, so it's incredibly you know high. So we wrote a big uh, story about that, and we're told uh, partly as a result of that um, that this uh, project was one of the first grants under the, the new National Alzheimer's um, plan. And they have just now begun testing, uh, they're testing an anti-amyloid drug um, on members of this family, um, probably about up to 15 years before they might get the... Who, who's uh, testing? Who's doing um, this is, uh, the scientists are, it's a collaboration between the Banner Alzheimer's Institute in Phoenix and um, Colombian researchers. There's a, a very dedicated um, neurologist, uh, Francisco Lopera in Medellin, who has been following these families for 30 years. What, what are you learning about Alzheimer's? As you, you've done, we were talking earlier today with one of our research scientists about telomeres, mm -hmm. and telomeres at one point have, you may want to describe them, and they at one point seen as perhaps a window, a biomarker into, into Alzheimer's, and you were saying that there's some doubts about that. Now, when, when you look at the, at, at generally at the science, the illness of of Alzheimer's, what are you finding? Is there great growth, great stories, 
great advances, break, potential breakthroughs? Well, yeah, it's a really, it turns out that there's, it's a really exciting time. Um, and that story that we did, the Columbia story, became, um, after I did that story, my editor said, oh, you know, we should start really looking at this. Um, and we've, a colleague of mine, uh, Gina Collada, and I have been, over the last couple of years, writing occasional stories. Of the vanishing mind it's, is under the umbrella of the vanishing right, mind. Right, right. And what we're finding is that I think there are sort of two main streams where there's sort of exciting things going on. One is this issue of prevention, the possibility of prevention, which is what the folks in Colombia are, are doing. There are other groups um, around the world who are looking at possible ways to prevent. Um, and obviously, if that, or, or delay the onset of symptoms. and. Um, and obviously, if that can be done, that's very exciting. Um, the other thing that's happening you know, now is that um, detection is becoming much, much more accurate. Um, so um, we, can, we can identify uh, Alzheimer's pathology um, you know, 10, 20 years before onset of symptoms. And that raises currently some you know, questions of, do you want to know if there's no effective way to treat it? So we're sort of looking at those things. But also, it's setting you know, kind of new targets for researchers. So maybe they're looking at you know, uh, trying to identify biomarkers that could be actually attacked in the same way that, for example, high cholesterol um, is now you know a biomarker for you know heart disease, and you can treat the high cholesterol to try to prevent the heart disease, and that's that's the way it's going in Alzheimer's. And um, we just had a story I think last week about the FDA considering um, accelerating a, accelerating drug approval um, so that you wouldn't have to have proof that a drug um, would ameliorate clinical symptoms of the disease. But if it, if it addressed the biomarker, that might be enough. One of the interesting things you wrote about a few years ago were five studies that were presented at the Alzheimer's Association International Conference that tied the decline in thinking skills like memory planning almost in parallel with the ability to walk fluidly. So th what, what is the tie? What are they finding the tie in between movement and cognitive skills? Yeah, so that's, what, that's, that's the kind of thing that I, those are, those are the kinds of stories that, you know, you, you look at, say, a field like Alzheimer's, and it's, there's so much happening, and there's so many studies, and how do we pick which ones to write about? And I always feel like we're looking for research that's, you know, has uh, some results that are significant. Um, but we're also looking for things that are surprising or counterintuitive. And that was one that I thought was, was very interesting. You know, at first blush, you'd think, why would it be that if you're a slow walker or your walk is declining, why would that have anything to do with your cognitive ability? Um, but then if you sort of unpack it a little bit, uh, you know, you can see that there are parallels. I mean, motor skills are driven by the brain just as cognitive skills are. And um, there, you know, there are um, some of the things that are involved in walking, planning, um, you know, what's called executive function, you know, um, you know, we, we do it, we think it's, it's it, we do it automatically, but actually the brain's doing a lot of stuff to, to get us to walk. And so it, it makes sense that if you see a decline in um, your, your gait speed or your coordination that's sort of um, more advanced um, or more pronounced than a, an age-related decline ought to be, um, that, that you might also see some cognitive decline. You know, when we were, when we were talking earlier today, you, you were saying that uh, someone asked you at a, you were at the Commonwealth Club last night, and one of the questions was, do you find your work frustrating? Sitting here listening to you, I, your work is fascinating. You as a journalist must be looking through this window and thinking, I'm at the most exciting age to be covering healthcare, biomedical breakthroughs, innovations. Is that how you feel? Oh, I, I, I just love the work that I, that I do. Um, uh, you know, 
it's um, I, I didn't really know how to answer that question because I I don't I don't find it um, frustrating at all. I just find it to be this incredible privilege that I get to um, talk to interesting people and 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 enter people's you know communities and lives and tell their stories. Um, and it's um, it's just this wonderful combination of being able to learn about stuff and then actually use what's hopefully the creative process of writing it and communicating it and ideally you know making a difference for the people who read it and maybe for the people whose stories are being told so it's um, it, it's very exciting and when you're talking about healthcare um, you know there aren't too many more important subjects that affects everybody in one way or another. You spent time in a California prison, not as an inmate, I might add, but doing a story about first-degree murderers who were working with other first-degree murderers, taking, assisting them with Alzheimer's. The first-degree murderers had Alzheimer's, one population. The other first-degree murderers were caretakers. How did you find out? It's such an interesting story. How did you find out about how did the warden, I guess, put this into place? Um, so what I, that again, I sort of try to have my antenna out for things that are surprising. Um, and I came across a small paper that was presented, I think, in Canada about that program. And I said, really? That's kind of interesting. Um, and then it, you know, you verify that it's actually going on. Um, that was generated by the um, Alzheimer's Association chapter in, this is in San Luis Obispo, it's the um, uh, California men's colony. Um, and they had, um, were working with um, the person who at the time I think was the chief psychologist at the prison. And you know, what, what's going on in prisons? Um, uh, you know, the population generally outside of prisons is aging rapidly. We all know that, right? The baby boom generation. Well, in prisons, you, as particularly in, in, in your state here where you have these you know, life sentences, um, you've got a aging population and they're getting dementia and a lot of them have extra risk factors for dementia because they may have had head injuries, they have uh, you know, f fairly low education, um, uh, you know, a lot of them have mental illness that or depression that may kind of parallel or exacerbate dementia. And the system can't afford to take care of them because it's very expensive to hire caregivers. So they came up with a solution where they train other inmates to, um, to basically be the caregivers for these inmates with dementia, bathing them, you know, helping them dress, um, you know, taking them to doctor's appointments, um, calming them down, uh, you know, reassuring them when they think that uh, uh, one of them used to wait by the gate, uh, still does, I think, every morning, um, convinced that his mother is going to be there to pick him up. Well, his mother's dead, you know, a long time ago. Um, and these, the inmates are the ones who bring him back and, and tell him, you know, they say, well, she'll be coming later, you know. Um, so it was just fascinating. One of the things that uh, you also told me earlier that when we were talking about the stories that really impact you personally, mm. there are six million children in the U.S. right now who have been diagnosed with severe mental illness. And you've written about the reality of what parents, caretakers, deal with every day in, um, in, in, with a seriously mentally ill child. Tell us about Haley Aspor. Aspor, yeah. What's her story? Um, well, so this was, uh, I think, about six years ago. Um, I, um, we decided to do an in-depth kind of portrait of a family struggling with uh, a child with mental illness. And um, again, the sort of criteria for that, when people talk about, you know, why, fully identifying people with sensitive issues, um, we wanted to be able to focus on a, a family who would be openly telling their story um, because we felt that um, that 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 brings a certain um, credibility to the issue and this is an issue obviously that has so much stigma to it 
Um, and so I, I, I spent uh, over several months a lot of time with the Abbotsford family. Haley was, I think, 11 then, had uh, m multiple uh, psychiatric diagnoses. It wasn't even really clear what she had. Um, it was just, uh, just in so much torment. And the family was trying very hard to, to figure out what the best treatment was for her and how to take care of her. And I basically sort of told the story from the point of view of each family member, including her older sister, who had become, uh, at one point, suicidal because she was just feeling so stressed out by, um, by the family having to focus so much on Haley. Um, and that story, um, it, got, it just got so much amazing reaction from readers, people who were so grateful to the Times and to the family for coming forward and sort of letting people see, you know, a window into what it is actually like and not being embarrassed about it. Um, you know, the father was having uh, almost, you know, hallucinations and nightmares because he just felt so helpless. Um, and the mother was trying to hold things together and navigate this Byzantine system of the schools and the hospitals and, um, you know, it was just um, it was just an incredible story, and I actually heard from them not too long ago, and she's she's doing she's doing much better. So there now. is some light. At the there end is of the some light. You know, it's it's a tough situation, but she is 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 doing better. Yeah. What what are the services available to these children, severely mentally ill children today? I mean, it's a very it's a very chopped up system. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, there's a shortage of child psychiatrists. Um, uh, there's, <clears throat> I think, um, uh, there's discussion, debate in within the psychiatric community about, you know, what type of therapy, what type of medication is best, um, which diagnoses are real diagnoses and which are, uh, and 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 which are are not. Um, uh, it's it's a very fraught uh, area that 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 um, you know bears a lot more reporting I think on our part but it's it's tough to do. You looked very closely at the morning after pill, and you read hundreds of pages of FDA documents, transcripts, scientific studies, and you talked to people involved in the original approval. What was the story? What were you trying to find out about the morning after pill? Right. So we were trying. This was a story that ran. Um, uh, last year, um, around, um, so what was happening is that the, the morning after pill was being debated in the presidential election and and just sort of in the atmosphere. Um, and there were claims that were being made uh, by uh, folks on the anti-abortion side that, that the pill um, prevents a fertilized egg from implanting in the uterus. And that's important because in, in, uh, in the view of anti-abortion advocates, um, that would be tantamount to being an abortion pill. Because for them, life begins at fertilization, and so anything that acts after that to disrupt the process is considered an abortifacient. That's not the way that the conventional, you know, medical community looks at it, they consider pregnancy to begin after implantation, but this has become a very big issue. And this is not something that anti-abortion advocates just kind of made up. It's actually on the label of, you know, the, of Plan B and, and, and Ella, it's, it says, it, you know, it probably works by blocking ovulation, um, in other words, preventing fertilization, but there's a chance that it could prevent implantation. And we were trying to figure out, is there actually science to back that up? Where did that come from? Does it actually do that? So I read pages and pages. Um, initially, the FDA would not talk to me about this at all, um, which was interesting. And, and then I kept finding out, you know, reading studies and talking to experts, um, that in fact, there had never been any science to support the idea that implantation was being disrupted. It was basically sort of grandfathered in from other types of birth control pills, but there had never been studies done that had shown that these pills did that. And that there were new studies um, on the most common morning after pill, which is 
Plan B and its generics, um, that, that gave strong support to the idea that implantation is not affected. So eventually, um, I, I got um, the FDA, I kept sending them questions, and um, I got this email back from a spokeswoman uh, from the agency who said that she had had this conversation with the high, high, high officials who dealt with this issue, and that their conclusion was, well, she's not stupid, um, which I considered high praise. And then um, they came back with what I'm told is a really extraordinary uh, statement for the FDA, which they basically said on the record, um, yeah, the science doesn't show, or the science shows that uh, that that Plan B um, does does not impede implantation. But so how essentially, did it get on the label? I mean, how did how did the FDA oh, come to the conclusion to put it on the label in the first place? Yeah, it's well, I think there are sort of two reasons. It's a longer discussion than we probably have time for. But one is that right. conventional birth control pills do appear to affect implantation. And so um, this was just something that was sort of part of the process. Now, interestingly, the company that manufactures Plan B, three times at approval and at two reviews since then, requested, even at the time of approval, that it not be put on the label, saying that there was no science to back it up. But the scientists who were doing this didn't really consider it a big issue, because remember, for them, they, they didn't see it in the context of, of the abortion debate. They just said, you know, if there's a chance, why not put it on there? And if it does, w what does it matter? It doesn't, it's, still, it's still preventing what we consider pregnancy. Um, and then it became kind of mired in the, in the abortion debate, and then I think it became too politically difficult to remove it. And so interestingly, you know, since my story ran, I mean, we basically have the FDA on the record saying that their label is incorrect, um, but they have not... Um, they have not changed it yet. But um, several of the medical websites, including the NIH website and the Mayo Clinic website, um, as a result of our story, have taken that language out of there. And um, there was even an anti-abortion columnist who wrote um, this column saying that because of our story, he was now convinced um, that these were not abortion pills and that they actually might be good uh, for the anti-abortion side, because if they prevented unintended pregnancies, they would reduce the number of abortions. So, We're going to take your questions in a second, but I want to close with a story that's not about health and medicine, about science, because it's nonetheless a very interesting story. Tell us about Holly. Who is Holly? <laughs> so Holly... This was a story <laughs> she wrote six months ago? No, it was Three just, uh, it was just in uh, a couple months ago. It was recently, yeah. Holly is a cat, a uh, tortoiseshell cat, who got um, separated from her family on a, a trip that they were taking to Daytona Beach and somehow made it the 200 miles back to their, um, to their hometown in Florida. Um, and um, I was asked to do a story on the science behind that. Is it, you know, how could a cat find her way. So the cat uh, was home. on the holiday with the family. The cat, the cat was cat at the, da the Daytona Speedway at a mobile home rally with the family. Mm -hmm. And uh, for some reason got a little spooked and ran. <laughs> um, and two months later shows up at um, a, a neighbor's house in West Palm Beach um, and who didn't know this family, but they lived in the same town, straggling in, lost half of her weight, you know. Bag, putting down bags and airline tickets. And <laughs> sure. No, her claws were uh, shredded. Her pads were, you know, worn down. Uh, she would, had lost about seven pounds. And um, this woman, um, you know, feeds her uh, for a week until she gets her to come into the house and wants to keep her, and she's naming her Cosette after the orphan in Les Mis. And she takes her to the vet to get her checked out. And, um, and the vet says, um, you know, you ought to check and see if there's a microchip in her, an ID. And there was, and it turned out that it belonged uh, to this family that lived just a mile away. So um, that story got, uh, that story was most emailed for about a month. It got a huge, uh, huge response, and I was just telling you that an agent called me and was interested in having a book about it, but I, 
I don't, I don't quite see it. I, although I did, and I think you need to talk to the cat. And you know, I did get, I did get among the many emails I got. I got an email from a, 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 a self-described cat communicator, who said that she would be willing to talk to the cat. So uh, stay tuned. You know? <laughs> Pam, thank you for uh, being here today and joining us. <laughs> We're going to take questions from the audience. And uh... I've always found the New York Times to be extremely interesting. As a matter of fact, I spent too much of my day reading it. <laughs> and obviously, your talk shows that your subjects are all made interesting. Everything that's been discussed has had an interesting aspect. The Affordable Care Act has never been fully understood by many of the population in a remarkable way. Would there be a way that you could make the Affordable Care Act interesting so that more people could understand it? Um, well, um, I, I don't know if this is fortunate or not. I guess um, the question guess yeah. it would be also, as a journalist, do you feel responsible for you know, clarifying, as you well know, the Affordable mm -hmm. Care Act has been so politicized. Right. What is it? What is it not? The Obama administration did a terrible job explaining it. They walked away from it. Death panels became the cry. Do you feel as a journalist responsible for clarifying the record on, on health science issues? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I actually don't do a lot of health policy types of stories of being in the science department. I'm doing mostly medical stories. So I, I, I think I've only written one story about about the Affordable Care Act, and that's mostly covered out of our Washington bureau. And I think they have done, you know, a good job in trying to explain it. It's tough to explain in an engaging way, and I think, you know, we continue as a paper to try to find ways with policies like that to show how real people will be or could be affected. And that's the way that I look at at, at everything. Um, that I write, which is that um, you know, if it's a political issue, I want to get beyond the politics, and I want to um, uh, look at what the science says and what the impact uh, could or is uh, going to be on real people who are experiencing, you know, the whatever it is, um, and I, that's what I see our, our mission as. Um, you know, we. We are to, um, we're to we're translators in some way, um, and and our job is 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 to try to show people what's really going on. Thank you. I'd like to get back, if I could, to Dr. Lepre, and to ask you as to whether Dr. Lepre may actually be at the epicenter of our national healthcare dilemma. Um, I, I teach health policy here at Stanford, but. For eight years, I was a Dr. Lepre in the Santa Cruz Mountains, about a, uh, an hour south of here. I was the only doctor for about 5,000 people. With I had a doobie brother as a patient, as well as farm workers. And, and Dr. Lepre can do no wrong, because on Nantucket, by definition, if he wants to do it, it's the right thing to do. But Dr. Lepre would have a tough time at Partners Health, because he would have a tough time in Kaiser Permanente, where I, where I went to practice after I was in the mountains. Because in Kaiser Permanente, you have to think of the whole system and keep the system going and practice appropriate medicine and cost-effective medicine. And just because you want to do it doesn't always make it right. Um, with the, the cost run-ups and the overuse of imaging and the inappropriate use of medications and, and doctors saying, well, you know, it's partner's health who's trying to reduce the quality of care. It's really an issue of of partnership, and doesn't he kind of embody this, the independent physician who can't partner with the rest of the system to make the system work? Um, you know, I think he is partnering with the system in uh, as long, you know, he he's trying to, um, he's trying to do it in his way. You know, he doesn't completely flout the system. He he does recognize that there are there there are advantages for what he wants to do, um, and and he has had has had cases where, um, you know, he's been able to to make things happen because faster, because of the association with Mass General and with partners, and he knows that. Um, 
I think it's just that, um, uh, you know, for example, they have a physician's organization, Mass General Physician's Organization, and all the other, uh, the few other doctors on the island have signed up with it. And they measure, uh, they have a, a measure of, you know, physician's time uh, spent with patients that they call relative value units. Well, you know, you can imagine what Dr. Lepre wants to do with those relative value units. And um, he has not signed up with the, with, with the physician's organization. And, um, you know, he, do, he, doesn't, he doesn't want to have his schedule ruled by that, and he doesn't want to have um, the 18-minute visits. You know, I don't think of it so much as it's right because he says it's right. I think it's, I, I, I don't, he's not quite, you know, even though he does have signs in his office that say, um, you know, Tim Lemprey, uh, czar of pain or something like that, you know, uh, he isn't a czar there. You know, he is working within the system, but he's just, he wants to pick and choose the way he does it. But he also can. Choose it he because also he's can. isolated on an island and yes. he's a sole practitioner. Well, and also because he is fulfilling crucial functions that it's going to be very difficult to find somebody else to do. Because if you are a surgeon, um, you know, frankly, there's not enough actual surgery on an island like that, in a community like that, to keep a, a surgeon working full time. And so if you're going to be a surgeon there, you're going to have to also do other things. You're going to have to be a family practitioner or, or you know, do C-sections or, or something else. And it's going to be hard to find, um, you know, young doctors, new doctors coming up who, who, want, it, who want to do both of those things with the demands that, on, on, uh, you know, on your time that, that, that it takes for him. So he's very valuable there. Hi. I think you're being modest by um, the question of how you get the subjects to open up. One thing that you didn't mention is how much time you spend on the stories. And so a recent article that you wrote, uh, you interviewed one of my patients and spent the entire day with him, you know, flew out from New York to San Francisco and spent the entire day at his home going to where he used to work and so forth. And it's interesting because the article was about lots of people and so he ended up being a fairly small part. So I can only imagine that everybody else that was quoted in the article you spent similar amounts of time with. And it meant a lot to the patient um, that somebody cared that much. And so um, I, I think that you didn't give credit for that, but, but I was very impressed with how much time you spent with the patient. And it gets a little bit to the question of Dr. Lepre and so forth is how much time is valuable and that as physicians we spend so much time now um, justifying RVUs, talking to insurance companies, and it reduces more and more the amount of time spent with patients. So we just had an RVU workshop where I found out that if I described what I had done but didn't label it, that I would get no credit for any of that. So I could have, you know, an entire paragraph describing everything, but if it wasn't labeled with a specific modality, that that um, I would, you know, not me personally, but the hospital would not get um, any credit for what happened. And so more and more things like that are seem to be running what happens in medicine. And so the actual time spent face to face with the patient is um, reduced and eaten away at. And I think that's what Dr. Lepre is. I don't know how much time he spends in a day arguing with insurance companies, <laughs> you know, to be um, able to do all these things that he's doing to know his patients that well. Yeah, well, he does have, uh, he does hire a lot of people. He doesn't, you know, um, because he has a trouble saying no to people. <laughs> and um, um, But uh, to your point, though, thank you very much for, for saying that. But I could also tell in working with you on that story that you're a physician who also, you know, obviously doesn't want to live in the world of RVUs. Um, I mean, you knew everything about your patient um, from, you know, uh, his, his long history and long struggle, um, his job situation, um, you know, his, uh, the story was about smoking and mental illness and his sort of tumultuous struggle with smoking, um, his parents, um, and that, that is the kind of thing that 
I, I think you know most good doctors want to be able to do because you're treating the whole person. Um, you know what happens in their life outside your office is can be very very relevant to what you are treating them for in your office, um, and and um, and and. You know, I think when you asked, you know, what are doctors frustrated by, it's, it's that very thing. It's the things, it's the, the walls that go up that prevent you from making those connections that can be valuable to your actual treatment of the, of the patient. Island yeah. Practice has been purchased by Imagine Films and Imagine, and it's mm -hmm. being made into a television series? Yes. What's the status uh, of that? Well, so, <laughs> um, yeah, so Imagine Television is Ron Howard's uh, production company, and they, in conjunction with 20th Century Fox as a studio, um, they've, they've bought the book. Um, they have chosen and uh, been working with this wonderful screenwriter named Amy Holden Jones, who is actually a feature film writer, um, who has written movies like Mystic Pizza and Indecent Proposal and the Beethoven movies. And she's um, produced a, a draft, a, a, a pilot script, uh, which is now being um, apparently enthusiastically circulated. And we'll see what happens. It's going to be a fictionalized version of, um, of, of island practice. Um, uh, Tim Lepre is. Um, uh, just turned 68. Um, he's bald. He's um, paunchy. Um, the main character in the TV series will be probably about 25 years younger, and I, I bet a dash or two more good-looking, and <laughs> and there will be some other changes. But the sensibility of the book is there. A lot of the characters are actually there. The names are changed, um, but it's uh, it's been really an exciting thing to this see so far. We'll see what happens, but um, it's been it's been a lot of fun so far. Any other I, Pam, I, I had a question here. Yeah. Um, you know, one story that science writers love and editors tend to love is the brilliant iconoclast, the person in medicine who has the idea that's rejected by the mainstream and can't get any oxygen. And some of those people are brilliant iconoclasts, uh -huh. and some of them are crazy. <laughs> and, it's a fine giving, line, right? Yes, and giving them oxygen and, you know, in the press can be a dangerous thing, actually. There's been some examples of that, for example, in HIV. How do you decide when you're when you're interviewing somebody like that who is truly the brilliant iconoclast who needs that oxygen and who is the person that, to whom it would be dangerous to to give that platform? Right, that's a really interesting question. Um, I uh, I've been getting emails from a guy who is um, campaigning for the Nobel Prize in Physics and invoking some putative research that he did with Yoko Ono and Paul McCartney, and that guy's not getting any oxygen, you know? Um, but, <laughs> um, you know, I think it, it, a lot of it just go, it goes back to, to investing the time. Um, in the case of Dr. Lepre, um, you know, for example, I, was, I would hear stories that he's, you know, this brilliant diagnostician. And whenever I hear that, you know, I, I, I'm always skeptical of people saying that because you think, well, they're just watching too much house or, you know, it's, um, but so I started looking into these cases and talking to the patients and, you know, trying to figure out. And it turned out that I, I feel quite confident saying that he is actually a, an incredibly uh, astute diagnostician and, and there are reasons for it. He reads like crazy. He retains uh, all sorts of uh, ancillary information, um, and he sees such a variety of cases that, um, you know, when the uh, when the woman brought her baby in screaming, the baby screaming, um, he was able to recognize that the baby had toe tourniquet syndrome, which turns out to be something that's actually not that uncommon, but a lot of physicians don't know how to recognize it. Uh, a hair often from the mother's head gets wrapped around the toe. It cuts off circulation. You know, if it's not treated, the baby can lose the toe, get gangrene, um, and you know, he he knew what it was. He knew that a guy who appeared to have skin cancer actually had tularemia, which only occurs about 200 cases a year in the United States. But he had that information. You know, I mean, the case after case after case. So I I satisfied myself through reporting that. 
that there was, uh, you know, that there was, um, there was some there there, um, and and that's, you know, that's why I felt like you know it, it, it was worth talking about that in the in the book. Here, last question. Um, I'm curious about the kind of training or background that you had that uh, qualifies you essentially to be a writer of technical or medical information, um, and if there's a, um, an editorial process that your writing has to be subjected to to make sure that it's technically or medically accurate. I'm just curious about that process. Um, okay, so I have very little formal um, background that qualifies me to, to, you know, to write about medicine. I mean, I, I went to Princeton, I studied international relations, um, I, um, and, and a whole bunch of other things, but, um, uh, and I studied Chinese, and I went to Asia, and um, for much of my career, I've been a, a generalist, um, but always interested in health and medical issues, and have always, along the way, in my various stations and stops, written about these issues. Um, and then I had a, a Knight Fellowship a few years ago at Harvard and MIT, where I studied health and science. Um, and after that, uh, the Times asked me if I wanted to cover this, this area. Um, some of my colleagues in the science department have, you know, more uh, formal scientific training. Um, and, you know, they bring that expertise, um, which is terrific. Um, and I guess what I bring is, is more sort of um, uh, the, the ability to connect you know, the, I, I'm, I'm able to navigate the complexity of these issues and I'm interested in them, and I'm interested in getting to the bottom of the science. I can read papers and under, understand them and ask questions, but I also have the ability, I think, you know, to sort of connect that with, uh, with how it might actually affect people and to talk to people about that. So that seems to be the thing that they have, you know, put me in the position of doing. Um, we, I mean, we have terrific editors. Um, uh, some of them, as I said before, have a lot of history with a number of these issues, and they are very, very good at um, asking the important questions. You know, does this study really stand up? Um, does it move the ball in terms of does it advance? You know, the field. Um, you know, how significant is it? Um, you know, we look at things. How large is the sample size? Um, you know, how well controlled is the study? Where did it appear? Was it peer reviewed? Um, uh, you know, we have various thresholds that we look at. And, and then we'll call on experts, uh, you know, frequently what I do when I'm reporting about a scientific study is that I'll go back to either that scientist or others in the field and say, you know, you, uh, uh, we're going to be writing about this, but we're not going to be naming every single drug um, or, uh, or, or physiological interaction the way that you have in the New England Journal of Medicine. If I explain it this way for a lay audience, is that accurate? Am I, 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 we're very conscious of the idea that, or uh, that I am, that, um, that we're communicating to the public, but we don't want to reduce the science um, or you know, oversimplify it because part of our public is the scientific community as well. So. Thanks, Pam, and thank you for joining us. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.